basically is, as background, these um, breeding objectives or indexes, uh, we use them to balance the, the breeding focus from one trait to another. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that just because we have a high economic weighting on a trait doesn't mean to say that it gets a lot of selection emphasis. For some traits, and, and lamb survival was an example where uh, because we don't uh, predict it as, as accurately as some of the other traits, it's not as, the breeding values aren't as spread out. So we've got a very high economic value of $100 or whatever a lamb, uh, but uh, because the breeding values aren't spread out, it doesn't get that much emphasis. So it's not just about the economic weights, it's how well we can predict the traits that determines the overall priority. Uh, but this particular process we're talking about is the, the economic side of that, that question. So we could think of this as looking for the uh, sheep of the future. Um, I was uh, uh, watching TV a week or so ago and Nigel Latter and John Campbell th seem to think there isn't a uh, sheep of the future. That means you guys are all going to be breeding grasshoppers. Um, in, um, I, don't, I don't know if you saw that, we're going to be farming insects in the future. And uh, my wife has, has taken particular delight in this at, at dinner parties by um, introducing me to people and saying, oh, he, he, he helps people breed sheep, uh, but and then taking great delight in saying, oh, but it's going to be grasshoppers in the future, which is, she saw the, the anger and frustration on my, um, my face when I was watching that TV program, and they were saying uh, we should be breeding, uh, or we should be farming grasshoppers into the future. So, so maybe I'm short-sighted, but I think we can, we can do better than that with sheep. Um, so we've got to keep, keep going with this stuff. So it's the sheep of the future, but we also got to look at a little bit at the past and the current, what are the markets telling us, and try and look out for what fundamental shifts are happening. So that's why we kind of review, review these um, breeding objectives. So I don't want to dwell on all this, but there's always lots of arguments about what traits should be prioritised. So we try and use objective information as much as we can, and we've gone to all possible sources from universities, old research studies, uh, meat companies, uh, stats, etc. So that we make it as independent and impartial as we possibly can and as technically valid as we can. So the first thing that we've done is uh, go through, well actually for, for this particular set of assumptions that go into the economic weightings, we go to the um, Meat and Wool Economic Service or Beef and Lamb Genetics Econ uh, Economic Service and ask them to say, well, uh, for a lamb in five years' time, what do you think the price will be? So back in 2000, we did, 10, we did this, and they said we expect it to be about $77. Last year when we did this breeding objective review, we went and asked, and they said uh, about $100. So 25% so uh, or so more increase in the, in the value of a lamb. So then what if the, that lamb is heavier by one kilo of carcass weight? Well, then we can see that's gone up from $4.40 to $5.75. These are the projections. Remember, the, you also get paid for cull ewes, and the bigger the cull ewe, the more you get paid, so we need to factor that in. So the projections of cull ewe values have also gone up, uh, as is the uh, expected store lamb prices, and wool also predicted to um, go up. That's yeah. Yeah. So that's what we got last year from the from the economic service, and you know that would, as you know, sort of our feeling is that they are the best people to um, assess these things. So if you look at the land price, and we are going in with $100, it was $77. I think that you could look at that and say, yes, leaving at $77. Uh, is too low. Uh, we're not quite at consistently at the $100, but it's a lot closer to that. And remember, we're breeding for the future, uh, not for, for now or the past. So another factor that um, is worth mentioning that we build into this, the part of the value of fast-growing lambs is that we can get them off to slaughter earlier. Uh, and what we do see, even though it's very variable from year to year, uh, that it if we look from January through to March, there's a downward drift in the, in the price, the average price of lamb. So sometimes that's a really, really severe uh, drop, which we've got 2012 there. Other times it actually goes up. Uh, but on average, we see about a 7% drop uh, over two weeks. 
And um, so when we did, we did exactly that analysis in 2010 and we saw that we lose about um, uh, five cents per head per day uh, through that period. And right now, if we look for the, the, the last, so that was, say, 2005 to 2010. Now, if we look from 2011 to 2016, we get a slightly bigger uh, average drop. So that just, just put increasing the value of growth rate a wee bit. So it's, it's effectively the cost of the grass No, absolutely not. It's just purely the schedule price dropping, yep. So, so the cost of the grass they're eating is all factored into it as well, yep, yep. So another thing is that we need to put, uh, the, the way the indexes work is we put some emphasis on weaning weight to, uh, to value growth rate and others directly on carcass weight. The reason that we put some of the emphasis on weaning weight is for the animals that get sold as stores. Uh, then, So if your ram buyer is buying your rams and then selling store lambs, well then uh, he, he's only really interested in what he gets for the, for the store lamb. Uh, so, so part of the weighting between weaning weight versus carcass weight determines on how many animals are getting sold as stores. So um, uh, what we've found is that there are uh, more lambs, compared with 2010, more lambs getting slaughtered early season and um, less that's at the expense of animals being slaughtered mid-season and the um, proportion being sold stores here is also... Um, uh, dropped quite a bit, and that's it's moved away from mid-season stores and towards uh, late-season stores. So this um, there's a lot of complicated stuff that goes on and behind this, but it's all to trying to work out what the value is of faster growth rate and all these different different systems, these different kinds of lambs. So we also have to cost in the fact of uh, feed. So faster growing lambs, for example. Uh, are more feed efficient because there's less, less time standing around burning up maintenance. So uh, therefore we need to put in the cost of the feed associated with, the, with growth and also for the ewes, etc. So we tend to value spring feed at quite a low cost. So these are per, uh, per megajoule of ME, so roughly you can multiply them by 10 uh, and they would be then in, in dollars. Uh, so we're talking about one to four cents is what we value that surplus spring uh, feed at, uh, whereas in the um, in the sort of more finishing feed we're talking 18 to 12. It was 18, and now we're saying uh, 24 cents um, uh, per kilogram of dry matter. And then in the, um, uh, the for the ewes, because you get a much higher utilisation and they are eating you know the, the rubbish left over. Uh, that we don't penalise the, their feed quite so, quite so high. And then we've got high winter feed costs. But in generally these things have gone up. This one in particular is very important and that's really the fact that uh, now that if, you don't, if you don't put that feed into your genetically improved lamb, you could put it into another lamb and that other lamb is now worth more than what it was and so, you can, so the opportunity cost of it is, is higher. So another sort of factor is we're saying, well, there is the, the way farming systems evolve, there is less of a spring surplus problem on a sheep farm now. And so we actually have to say, well, having more demand for, for feed in the spring, you know, we do have to cost that in. So now if we look at the, um, the actual weightings, if you, if you put all those numbers I've been talking about into the model, uh, what is the penalty in cents uh, per trait that, that, that you would see on the front of your SIL report for the index weighting? So, so you mature weight um, after the adjustment for the kind of over dispersion and, and you weight size uh, was at 119. And if we keep that adjustment in, that penalty does uh, increase by about 23%. But then offsetting that, we've got uh, carcass weight now because of the higher value uh, of, the, of the lambs, the extra kilos on, on the lambs, then um, we, we've also kind of got a corresponding uh, increase in, in the value of the lamb. So the, actually the, the balancing point between ewe weight versus early lamb growth has actually stayed quite balanced. Uh, but weaning weight has got less 
uh, less weighting in the, in the index, and that's because of the reductions in the uh, store lambs, and also for the fact that we are putting more value on the early spring feed. So in the, uh, because we have to avoid uh, double counting, the, uh, the, the index, um, it, it, it valued weaning weight not in terms of extra output, but rather that, that fast weaning weight means you've got more feed demand in the early spring when you've got surplus feed, and that's when you'd be happy, happy to have it eaten. Uh, if you have an animal with the same carcass weight but with a low weaning weight, then you've got to put that uh, weight on at a time when the feed is more expensive. So, so just those two things there have meant that we've got less weighting on uh, weaning weight direct. But in terms of the growth story, the aggregate growth, growth story, it's more about carcass weight and this balance between, between young animal growth and mature size has pretty much stayed about the same. So if we extend that out now and look at some of the other traits, then um, we've talked about those top four. Uh, so the lambs are worth more, so they've increased by 30% for litter size, the number of lambs born and lamb survival, so those, their economic weights have increased quite a bit. Uh, we've got the fleece weight is kind of increased in about the same proportion uh, as the growth traits. Um, and we've got hog up pregnancy. So the key point is here that actually these are all sort of consistent across the board increases in the values by uh, 25 to 30% except for the, the few exceptions that I've, I've pointed out to you. Now another area where things have changed a bit is the breakdown of the, the carcass from shoulder, leg and loin. And the big thing that has happened in the market really is that the, um, the, the, the premium for loin relative to shoulder and leg has dropped. So uh, here was a big discount on the shoulder lean uh, value uh, compared with the loin and now this one hasn't increased much at all whereas this one has increased dramatically. So, and, and that's a direct reflection of the, the markets and the payment system that um, coming out. So, so all this is driven by the alliance uh, grading system and, and, and pricing system of, of how those different things are valued. And uh, basically we're seeing a shift away from the European uh, cuts where the loin and the leg were of higher value more, and now the, the meat companies through the, these sort of new markets are able to extract more value out of what was traditionally the lower, lower or less premium uh, parts of the carcass. So, so we think that makes sense. Yep, we have an argument. You, you yep. were saying that those marketing signals come from the alliance grading system. They they're not the whole industry. Are you modifying correct. that and reflecting that in the whole industry? We do, yes. So if I was Sam Lewis, I'd be saying this is rubbish and what we should do is have more animals with lambs with heavy bones. So yeah. My question to you, and it's only a question, is should you extrapolate one payment system from one meat company to the whole industry? Yeah, so it depends whether we're in this for the sort of short term game, what, what we can get out of it with the particular processor we're dealing with. I, we would prefer where we can to breed for the, the benefit of the whole industry. The breeder that is selling rams and all his buyers are selling to somebody that pays for weight only, they can choose not to uh, ultrasound scan, not to choose the meat module in their evaluation and, and effectively by doing that shift the emphasis back to growth. Uh, so so the, the, there are options but, but philosophically we'd prefer to breed for what we believe the market wants across the board and the fact that some processes are I would argue lazy in terms of uh, incentivising the best carcasses is something we kind of like to look beyond when we're, when we're breeding these sheep. Uh, yeah. Sorry, just yep. another question, question along the same, same line. So when you're doing the wool work, I mean, um, I'm not a crossbred wool grower, thanks for us. Uh, it's not that fresh at the moment, but are you also, um, you know, pro rata the fine wool stuff in there as well? Or Um, 
Well, I think the answer is yes, but the reality is that it's based off what um, the beef and lamb economic service tell us across the whole industry, and I would have thought that the the weighting given to the um, you know the cross the, the the finer end of it will be pretty pretty light in the thing. So it, it it's pretty much reflecting a you know a strong wool sheep. Uh, really, if you want to get into you know the indexes for the the more specialty wool focus, then they in theory have their own indexes that have been developed and can easily be updated with this stuff. The audience to use the mic. Thank you. I got you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, basically then um, these uh, change in weightings kind of run down, but the, the, the main theme is that the 20 to 30 percent um, through, through that so now if we try and, and predict the response to selection um, and the size of these <coughs> bits of pie uh, indicate uh, how much of the genetic progress and sense comes from these various groups of traits. And, and like I was trying to emphasize that the 25 to 30 percent change was applying across all the traits, it turns out that if you apply these weightings, then the, the bits of the pie in terms of the genetic progress we're going to get actually stay quite a bit the same. Uh, and that this is no cap on NLB, so the cap NLB story I'll just touch on in a minute. Uh, so we would see about 50% of the genetic progress coming from uh, growth, a very, virtually no change in new mature weight. So we're getting all that gain in growth without increasing the mature size of the ewe, so that's this penalty on the ewe, ewe mature size, so that's not stopping a lot of genetic gain and growth, but it is tempering the, the size of the ewes. We're seeing about 25 per cent of the, um, of the gain coming still from uh, litter size, and a little bit of wool there, so, so reality is we could go back and change the wool weighting, uh, but that, that, all that do with that segment, which is already small, would just get a little bit smaller. And we've got a bit there, about 12-13% for survival. So then um, CAT uh, NLB, this um, picture's been through the wash a little bit and come out a bit wrinkly. Uh, but this is the idea that I guess is a theme that has been uh, we've been trying to push for a few years is uh, we don't want to keep pushing for uh, litter size forever because they're going to get too prolific. And kind of mirroring that sort of scientist feeling is what we've heard back from the industry saying, these rams at the top of the list are, are way out there for NLB and no good for anything else. We don't want them at the top of the list. So, so in the kind of linear mathematical world of the geneticists, we've had to try and, um, and think of a way, well, how can, we, how can we account for this without screwing up uh, everything that we kind of hold dear in terms of these these indexes and, and still keep them efficient. So the, the solution with, that we've come up to, uh, come up with, is to say, well, we don't, uh, as, you, as you get more and more average prolificacy, the value of a little bit more gets less and less. So, so if we just stick with the old weighting of 22, I uh, uh, can't remember what it was, $22 or something, then, then we would rank, as your breeding value for litter size got up here into stratospheric proportions, your index or your, the contribution of NLB to the index also goes up. Uh, so now we're saying once you get beyond this sort of range of 0.2 to 0.4, we're not giving you any more credit. We're not going to penalise you uh, for being so prolific, but we're not going to give you credit for it. So you, we, we could have actually bent this curve over, so we penalise the very prolific animals, but, but that we don't want to do because that's inefficient. Some of those, some of these rams out here, as long as they're good for other traits, they can be mated to use down here and lift the population along this trajectory. So, so it's kind of a, we, we, we don't want to uh, throw out the, the very prolific rams that are good for other traits because they're good for the other traits and we don't want to lose that, but we don't want the very prolific rams that are crap for other traits uh, getting way higher indexes. So this is, this is kind of the solution that we've come up with. It's, it's complicated a little bit in behind the scenes, but hopefully uh, it's a relatively simple principle that, that's going to meet the, the requirements of 
uh, of the, the practicality. So, so what if we bring this in, this capped NLB? Everything I showed you before was just assuming we were going to put this, this linear weighting on, on, on NLB. So now if we bring this uh, capped NLB in, we see that we, the, the genetic gain from reproduction does get tempered down a bit. So from 29% to 21%, and that allows a little bit more to go into growth uh, and into wool and into survival. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. That just says what the genetic trends will be with and without, and you skim down those columns and they're not that much different. And that's for every 100 cents of genetic gain and index that you'd make. Yeah. Okay, all right. I don't think you want to see this table anyway any longer, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so then, um, if we, I've been talk, talking about New Zealand maternal worth now, that was the maternal side now. If we look at the terminal side, uh, we've got a very similar pattern of these 25 to 30%. Remember, the shoulder's now worth relatively more than the, the loin and the weaning weight penalty is in there, uh, but it's pretty much the same sort of story. Uh, w w one thing, um, we do have a penalty for fat yield. We don't penalise fat yield on the maternal because we want to keep the body reserves in the ewe, but on the terminal side we've still got a, a fat penalty. The fat penalty hasn't gone up quite as much as some of the growth rate traits, uh, but it's still, it is still or gone down would be a better way to say, but we, we, we're sticking with the fat yield penalty. And although we hear people saying uh, that maybe the sheep are getting too lean, I guess the counter argument to that is that the carcasses are getting bigger and bigger. And, and, and if you believe that that trend is going to carry on, for uh, that's 35 years there, that trend, and yes, it, it flattens out and dips off from time to time, but it it seems to me likely that the carcasses are going to keep bigger. It's just an efficient way to produce uh, lamb is to take out the lambs bigger and then we need them to not go over fat, particularly the ewe lamb, so we've just got to, to be a bit mindful of the, the fat there. So the response to selection, again, the, the take-home message is we played around with all these things, but the relative genetic progress you're going to make by selecting on these indexes is not going to change uh, that much. So uh, these are the expected uh, genetic trends again. Uh, in the interest of uh, more questions, uh, let's just uh, move on. And I just want to focus on one option uh, that we'd like to put forward for the New Zealand Maternal uh, Worth Index. So, so remember I've said that all the economic weights are going to increase by 25 to 30%. That means that if you get a new list uh, with these indexes, I any animal that was, say, 2,000 cents or 1,500 cents, it's automatically going to jump up by 20 to 30%. So your whole, your whole scale of the way you look at indexes is going to change. So... Um, so introducing the capped NLB kind of moderates that a little bit, uh, but we've kind of had this idea uh, brewing around for a while. At some time it would be really good to change the index scale from, from per ewe lambing to per lamb born. So, um, you know, so right now if you have an index of 1,500 cents, that means if, the, if, if your ram buyer over time, transports has flopped from being an average of 1,500 cents to an average of 2,000 cents, then that is $5 a U divided by 2, $2.50 uh, per U in that flock. So, so the, the, in terms of communicating the value of that index to your RAM buyer is pretty abstract. So we would prefer to change the, um, the index so that you could just say, uh, for every um, for every extra hundred cents or five hundred cents of index, uh, how many lambs are you going to get from that from that ram? Multiply that by the, the the index units and divide by two because this is a breeding value and you're only going to get half the benefit of that in your lambs. And this is the the calculation to work out what the dollar value of that index is in, in your offspring. So so. Uh, we would propose that this change be implemented at the same time. So we're already, already going to stuff you all up by changing the, the weights to make them higher and change all your index values. So while we're stuffing you up with that, let's stuff you up with something else at the same time 
so that you don't really notice and you'll finish up with something better and easier to interpret. So, um, so if, if you think about what does this ha happen, what, what effect would these various things have on the, your, your average index of your RAMs and on how spread out the index values are. So if we just forget about capped NLB and go with these new economic weights, well then the spread is going to be about 23% higher and that's the, all the economic weights have gone up by about that much, so that kind of explains that. And yeah, so they'll all lift up by about 280 cents of index value. But if we put this capped NLB, that means all those really, really prolific RAMs now don't get as much credit. Uh, so that actually pulls, pulls the spread back and it pulls the average down a wee bit. So then you would be, um, we'd, we'd increase them all, the index values by a couple of hundred cents and the spreads there increase by 15%. So then... Um, if we go on this new scale, which I'm talking about, as per, you, as per lamb born rather than per you lambing, then we'd actually drop all your index values by 160 cents. That's about a year's worth of genetic progress and would have no effect on the spread of them. Uh, but if we put capped NLB in, which we definitely want to do uh, with, this, with this new scale, well, then all your index values will drop by 350 cents and the scale, um, the spread will drop by about 20%. So uh, I think that at the moment uh, we're kind of all committed to bringing out um, the new economic weights with capped NLB, which will increase the average by 200 uh, cents and the spread by about 15%. There is an opportunity to change the units of the index to, to per lamb born and that would then have this impact of taking 350 cents off and uh, reducing the spread. So, so either way, uh, we're going to change, we're going to buggy you around, uh, but can we, the question I guess is, can we uh, change the scale to per lamb born? We believe that'll make it a lot easier for you to communicate the value of a superior ram to your, to your ram buyer. Okay, so that's a, uh, hopefully we'll, we can have an argument about that in a minute. Um, so we're, not, we're, not, we're not moving till, um, till quarter past, so we, we do need to debate that. We, we would like some discussion and um, some answers. Yep. Okay, so, so let's give you a wrap because there's a lot of stuff there. So the, the, all the economic values have gone up by 20 to 30 percent. That means that the value in, in 2016 dollars that your RAM buyers are getting from the work that you do is now uh, 20 to 30 percent higher than what those old index weightings uh, would say. Uh, although even though we've gone through this process, we, we haven't seen anything that's going to radically change the direction of genetic progress. Um, the capped NLB thing, um, it looks like it's uh, implementable, or it definitely is implementable. Uh, it's all set up there to go, and it, uh, it allows us to avoid overrating these excessively prolific animals. And we've got this opportunity to scale uh, the indexes to per, per ewe lamb born. Uh, we believe it makes them um, clearer to interpret, but you're going to have this um, drop in average ind index value and a little bit less spread in them. Okay. So now whenever you start asking questions, we'll get the microphone for you first, okay. The biggest problem I see, Peter, is, is the same problem that I think we've had for the last 20 years and that we are lacking extension. And it was interesting to talk to Andrew this morning just how they've got commercial um, farmers on board with putting the pressure on their um, beef, their bull producing guys. A and I think that, 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 that we la have been lagging for a long time as an industry in making hay out of the gains that you guys have made for us because we do not have a very effective extension um, um, in New Zealand agriculture. And so, so I think this is fine as long as you give us the tools to be able to explain to our clients what it all means. Because I've been busting my balls for years trying to explain EBVs to guys, and there are still breeders out there that, that are not even using it at all. And I know you're speaking to the converted here, but I think we, 
are lacking a huge opportunity to translate the research findings and everything else to, to gr growing New Zealand GDP, if you like. So that's not really what you're talking about, but I had to well, say it. Well, no, that's a, it's a deep question, and I'd like to twist it round and, and, and say that that's a, that's a vote in favour of changing to the new scale, because, uh, because it's going to make it a lot easier for us to give you the tool to communicate the value. And that's you give us extension tools, or provide people that can help extend it through our industry. Yeah, but... but <sighs> Well, that's that's true, but it, it it costs a lot of money to have a lot of people driving around giving these messages. I, I to, to, in my opinion, the best extenders of this breeding value information are the converted breeders. And 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 the, I I was talking to a breeder this morning. He said most of his uh, ram buyers are agnostic, and if he didn't if he didn't take the indexes and the numbers to them, that they wouldn't they wouldn't ask him for them. But he does. He takes the indexes and explains them, and they and they see the merit of it. But they need him to, to help them. The the problem with the extension person is that they drive up the the commercial farmers drive in June or July or something, and then he's forgotten it all by the time he goes and buys the um, buys his rams in November or December. So, so it, it, the best person to communicate this stuff as the ram breeder and we want to make the indexes simpler or the, the units of the indexes simpler to help them convince the buyer or to explain the buyer the value of the extra genetic progress he's making. Yeah. All right. Um, change it to lamb, uh, per lamb born. Brilliant. No right. brainer. And I'm just not comfortable with the reduction of the weaning weight um, 90% of the clients I sold rams to, first question was with growth, what's their weaning weight um, data, yeah. EBVs, etc. cetera. Um, I, I, I understand why you did it, but I don't agree with it. Yeah, so the, we, could, we could put more weighting on weaning weight and take it off carcass weight, but we can't have it on both because we'd be double counting. You know, you can't, you can't, yep, so you get, you get that. Um, so we, I guess maybe this is a, a, too much academic thinking, but we would prefer to put the prefer to put the weighting on the trait that the majority of the farmers actually get paid for. So we 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 already put some weighting on on weaning weight because of the store market. There would be some industries where they would argue there should be no weighting at all on weaning weight; it should all go on carcass weight. So we've kind of come, uh, we, we've, we've, we haven't come halfway, but we've moved that way. The, the other argument I'd make is the correlation between weaning weight breeding value and carcass weight breeding value at the time of ram sale is probably 0.8 or 0.9. So you're picking up those fast growing, if, if you're looking for a fast growing animal, whether you do it on carcass weight or weaning weight, you're pretty much going to find you've got the same um, the same animal, particularly at the commercial buyer level, at the, what they're going to be choosing among. So, so we could we could agonise over this, but I don't think you'd, we'd finish up with the ram buyer walking out of the gate with a different ram. If he really likes weaning weight, he can you can show him the weaning weight breeding value. I've got no objections to that. Yeah. Yep. Very quickly, Peter, um, I agree with Hamish. The weaning weight's important, but I think. The point he probably missed was it's important from a ewes milking ability, so that's maternal, not direct effect. So yep. I'd actually, I'd actually like to see that maternal um, weaning effect for the ewes milking ability higher, and that okay. doesn't double count growth. Then. No, indeed, yeah. So, so it, it so has increased, but it hasn't quite increased as much as, as it should. Yeah, well, <laughs> as you think it should. Um, so. Yeah. Okay, Charles, and, and, and Charles the other one you never, you never, at me. The other you, you never touched um, was why aren't we moving our base year forward? It's a nonsense to be so far back. Uh, yep, that's another argument, I, and I can't comment on it. I'll we'll log that. Okay, that's a good point. 